Hey everyone, hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. So what are we doing today? Today I'm going to be wrapping up all of the books that I read in April of this year. And I read a, quite a variety of books. I have nine books to talk about. Some of them I started in March and then finished in April and they really run, they run the gamut. <laughs> they're, they're like children's books all the way to classics, including a Russian classic and then also contemporary fiction, magical realism, and historical fiction. So they're really, I, I have something for everybody because I'm such an eclectic reader. And um, I also have, uh, the way that I like to do my wrap ups is I like to break everything into categories. Um, this helps me stay organized. I'm not the most organized person. And so this helps me stay organized with my thoughts and um, and all of that, but it also serves uh, as a roadmap, a uh, time-stamped roadmap for you all. So you can watch the video all the way through and then go back to the parts that you really enjoyed, um, or you can just cherry pick through this video what you wanna watch. Um, and so I have four categories for you all today. I have unpopular opinions. So books that I believe are very well loved on booktube, even though they didn't necessarily work for me. Um, I have a couple of women's prize, uh, women's prize for fiction books. If you've been following my channel and my women's prize for fiction series, I will leave this whole series, the playlist, <laughs> linked down below. Um, but the books will be to no surprise to you. Um, I also have a category that is a, a couple of nonfiction books that read better than fiction. The nonfiction were some of my standouts for the month. Um, and then I actually have standouts, like actual standout reads. Uh, and, um, and so yeah, so those are my categories. Um, An interesting component about this month is that I basically buddy read or group read every single book that I'm about to talk about. And even though there were some books that didn't work for me, this is not a reflection of the group that I read these with. The groups were amazing. My buddy reads were fantastic. Um, so even though these books, some of them didn't work out for me, it again has no reflection on the people who led the group or some up the buddy reader or anything like that. So starting with probably my most contrary opinion, we're going to talk about Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. So if you don't know anything about Pachinko, uh, this is what you ought to know. It is a historical fiction novel set mostly in Japan and it is a multi-generational family saga. And the generation, the family that you're following, they are ancestrally Korean but have immigrated to Japan. And it is all about their relationships with one another and with others <laughs> and with other people rather. <laughs> the love stories that they have with others. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and also the discrimination and prejudice that that was held against them for being ancestrally Korean. I went into this book with extremely high hopes, even though I really try and reset my expectations every single time I go into a book, just because I know that even though I maybe have that sort of like lighthearted puppy dog, <laughs> love, heart eye type of feeling when I enter the book, I try and like dampen down or reset my expectations so that I don't expect too much out of the book and I can let the book speak for itself and do what it's trying to do and, you know, kind of do its own thing without me being like, I want you to read like this. And even though I did that, the book still fell really flat for me. Uh, there were a lot of characters and a lot of superfluous characters, characters that I feel like could have been truncated or put together so that there weren't so many extra extraneous characters. Um, I thought the story was quite plotty and a little bit flat. And overall, I had a hard time identifying with the struggles of all of the main characters. I had a and then like when I would start to identify with um, some of the main characters, for example, there is a pair of brothers that I felt quite invested in. And then it seemed like the author would do things with these characters that would make me be like, oh, okay. Um, I guess I'm not interested in that character anymore. Um, so yeah, very odd experience for me because I know so many people do enjoy this book and do get along with it, but overall it really did fall quite flat for me. Pachinko is the perfect example of a book that, though I didn't like it, the group organizer is someone that I really respect and absolutely adore here on YouTube. And so the group was ran by Gem of Books and the group itself was made up of the most incredible booktubers um, and readers alike. I mean, the group was incredible. So it wasn't really about the group that read this, it truly was the book itself. It just, 
it just really didn't work for me. Anyways, I'm gonna move on from Pachinko. The next book that actually didn't work for me, I read with Kelly from Books I'm Not Reading. Kelly is yet another booktuber that I absolutely love and that she makes incredible videos. And we decided a while ago to read um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And I have this incredible copy. I mean, you could see it, right? It's all shiny. It has beautiful, like, original illustrations in it. Kelly has this absolutely stunning annotated edition of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. And so as we started reading it together, um, immediately there were things, certain scenes um, in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland that are so iconic, that are so familiar at this point in the game among children's literature and even Disney movies. I, I, I enjoyed when I encountered scenes that were, that were quite familiar to me. Um, and so I have this version, the version that is um, just the story itself. But since Kelly had this annotated version, as we would check in about our, you know, the chunks that we read, the chapters that we read, um, Kelly was connecting with the book so much more than, than I was. And it, I think some of it had to do with the fact that Lewis Carroll, um, with this first book, um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, he basically based this off of a story that he made up to, I believe, his daughter. So this originated from a nonsensical story that he just developed from the top of his mind. And so what I'm trying to say is that Kelly's annotated edition was wonderful because as she got to a poem that was nonsensical, as she got to um, a song that didn't make a lot of sense, the annotations would explain that this poem, this song, this line is um, part of the Victorian culture and so most children would understand and think it was funny um, because it's a play on a poem that they know. It's a joke based off of like something that they would have learned in school. And so a lot of it is like Victorian inside jokes. That's what Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is and Through the Looking Glass. They are Victorian inside jokes that for me were difficult to connect with. Um, probably because I lacked context, but since Kelly had context with her annotated Alice, um, she was able to like absorb it and enjoy it in a different way than me. And then she passed on her excitement to me. And that really helped elevate uh, both books. I read Through the Looking Glass on my Kindle and I have this one here. And though it was enjoyable in the sense that I was familiar with it and I wasn't completely lost and I knew what was happening, um, it wasn't, it just, it fell flat for me. The next two books I read, I actually read for the Women's Prize for Fiction, and so I'm actually going to touch on them very, very quickly. The first book I read was Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. I have a whole review um, that I can link down below for you. Um, it's a historical fiction novel, a behemoth of a thing, that is definitely making the rounds here on BookTube because it was shortlisted for the Booker, and it's now shortlisted for the Women's Prize for fiction. Um, and I read that with Sandy um, from Miss Reads A Lot and a friend and subscriber named Sonia. The next book I read for the Women's Prize for Fiction was Popey Show. And I read this with my friend George. Hi, George, um, who is a viewer of, of the channel and my friend. And um, I, was, I was really interested in this because it sounded so different. So Popey Show is set on an archipelago of islands. And everyone that lives on the islands, mostly everyone, has a little bit of something something so a little bit of magic so of all the books that I know of off of the Women's Prize for Fiction Popey Show is definitely one that is more like classic fantasy um, definitely more in the realm of fantasy than some of the other books that I picked up or um, even noticed on the list I suppose um, Popey Show at the end of the day at the at the whole at the whole of Popey Show the book itself is a quirky love story but it also covers the ideas of what we like the concept of what what do we do with our lives and what do we do with our talents how do we foster our talents how do we grow our talents I really like this I thought this book was incredibly inventive and some of the creative choices that Leon Ross made were not only laugh out loud funny but so unique and so 
odd that the oddness is now it has stuck in my mind and for that I I really enjoyed Poppy Show and it was one that I wanted to move on for the Women's Prize for Fiction but it didn't um, which is a total bummer but um, I loved its its magical quality and it was very well written it was well done I, I just I just loved it and it's one that will stick with me because of the creative choices that Ross made. If you know, you know, okay? If you know, you know, okay? <laughs> um, okay, and now I'm moving on. We've gotten into the category that I'm probably the most excited to talk about because there were two fantastic reads from this category. So the category is fiction, uh, nonfiction rather, better than fiction. Um, and the first book is Empire of Pain. I read this with um, Sandy from Miss Reads a lot and two friends and subscribers, Sonia and Deb. We do a lot of reads together. Empire of Pain is written by Patrick Radden Keefe, and it follows the story or the dynasty of the Sacklers. Now, the Sacklers had a lot to do with the pharmaceutical industry and the pain management industry. Um, and it really stems from three brothers that grew up during the Great Depression and the way that these three brothers basically grew the Oxycontin, specifically the Oxycontin industry, but also the pain management and medication industry. And they were or are quite responsible, at least the way that the book was written. They have quite a bit to do with the drug epidemic going on today. This book was incredibly difficult to read. Um, I, well, as I was reading it, I was so sucked in and I was sucked into the drama. Um, if you like dramatic books, uh, this is definitely for you. I basically felt like I was um, on a road, I was on a, a, a rageful journey the entire time. Like something would happen and it would take me off and then I would like get onto my phone and I would leave a, a chaotic message for all of those who are listening in our group and I would just be like I can't believe that this is true so much so that like I began to question Patrick Redd and Keefe's reporting because I was like no nobody is this evil like there's nobody can be this this evil um and then to, much to my chagrin and sort of like I had to eat my words at the very end of the book this is not a spoiler Patrick Redd and Keefe was like was saying that in his reporting he's always had to kind of scrimp and scrap and get the information and gather it up in order to make something like an article or a book. And for this particular book about the Oxycontin industry and the way that advertising and the Sackler family and the Oxy Oxycontin industry grew, um, this particular case, there was actually almost too much information. There was millions and millions of papers and documents and emails. And so I thought that was really interesting that, um, you know, I kind of wanted to be like, well, Patrick Red and Keith is stretching the truth a little bit and he's making these people sound very evil. No, no, he actually had too much information and he had to sort of like streamline it down as much as possible in order to make it a consumable, enjoyable, if that's what you want to call it, story. And it is scathing to the Sackler family. There's still stuff going on with the Sackler family and there's something about that that is hard for me to separate the present day and, and my now living here in South Carolina. It's harder for me to separate and so I find those types of books more anxiety provoking. So I'm not going to say I'm going to avoid current day politics or current day uh, difficult subjects but I now know that about myself that I have a hard time separating myself from the topic when it is so current. The next book we read, I read with Sandy from Mr. Reads a Lot um, and with Sonia, um, and it is All In by Billie Jean King. Billie Jean King is a female tennis player, and she really got in at the ground floor of tennis here in the United States, especially as a female athlete. Um, I listened to this on audio, on audio and Billie Jean King narrates and there are some moments where she's talking about her life and her love for her parents and her love for the sport and her love for the people in the sport and she like actually physically gets choked up as she's reading it and I found that so moving. Um, but what this book is about, it is about really her fighting for equality. Um, in tennis and for female tennis and she really like goes through the system and exposes its dark underbelly but in this way that is really empowering and encouraging and hopeful and vulnerable and sweet and I thought this book was 
fantastic. I love learning about uh, tennis. I love learning about some of Billie Jean King's um, most notable matches that I never knew about. <laughs> um, I enjoyed just being immersed in her world. And at one point, she mentions Anne Rands, which I think I'm saying her on, on, Anya on Rands, I don't, Anne Rands. <laughs> um, what is it called? You know, her famous book. Oh, Atlas Shrugged. So at one point, Billie Jean King talks about Atlas Shrugged and how the main protagonist in Atlas Shrugged is someone who like goes through the system of capitalism, exposing the dark underbelly. And it's so funny because she referenced that and that was definitely what she was doing in her book All In. Um, and, and also she talks about, you know, the difficulties in her life. And I found this book so engaging, but also heartwarming, hopeful, and emotional. And it was like the perfect read, especially coming off of, I read this after Empire of Pain and it was, it was definitely like the book that I needed after Empire of Pain. Okay, two more books to go. The first one took me forever to read because I started it in early March, but it, it's also a mammoth, so I feel really glad that I finished. It was one of my 22 books for 2022, and that is War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Yes, I finished this behemoth of a thing. Um, it took me about six weeks, and I did get stuck on epilogue two, which was like a whole thing. Um, so this talks about, obviously, war. Um, this talks about the Russian aristocracy during the Napoleonic era, um, and we are in Russia during this time. And so even, you know, Napoleon is a character, and it, it, it reads like a soap, uh, Russian soap opera. So I would say that um, Tolstoy has like three registers in which he writes in. The first register is when we are with the townspeople and getting all of the drama of love and marriage and betrayal and men going off to war and women waiting, all of, all of that stuff. That is like the one, the first register and the register that worked, the storytelling that worked the best for me personally as a reader. Then you have like this second register and I would say that is when you are on the battlefield and sometimes you are actually in the battlefield fighting a battle or with somebody who's like observing a battle around them or you're just among the generals and the people trying to figure out what to do in war and that's like a, the second register. I didn't love that writing as much mostly because I think I'm not super interested in, in war in and of itself. And so I would kind of not get lost, but I would be less engaged in those parts. And then we have the, the essays that a lot of people talk about. These um, inserts of essay length um, conversations, ideas that Tolstoy inserts into War and Peace and talks about the philosophy of war, the philosophy of choices, and the way that, you know, one can one person really be so influential or so important or, you know, so impactful to something as big as like a huge war. Um, and he's got opinions and ideas and he explores those. And that is like the third register. And that, that third register for me was very hit and miss. Um, sometimes I would think that the philosophy that he was discussing was probably the most dull thing in the world and that I just really didn't care for it and I didn't really care at all. But I'm glad that it was there because those who really, 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 really love Tolstoy would probably find hit his ideas about war and his ideas about life and fate and philosophy and all that stuff. I think people would find, readers would find that very interesting, especially if you are a huge fan of Tolstoy. Like for me, if Jane Austen had that in one of her novels, I would find that very, very interesting. But since I'm less interested in Tolstoy, at least in this moment, I didn't find those essays super engaging. But then every once in a while, there would be an essay and I would find it super engaging. Like there was an essay somewhere near the two thirds of the way through and he talks about the spirit of the Russian people. And I found that fascinating. And then I went on Wikipedia and I looked it up and the event that he's talking about actually did happen. And he was just giving his take on it and the, the you know, what, what builds a Russian, what makes a Russian. And I thought that was really, really fascinating. So much so that like, I really didn't mind his other meandering thoughts in those essays that I encountered before or after, but then, the last, the last section of log two is an essay on his philosophy of, of war, kind of continuing with that theme. And it took me, I, I waited <laughs> like a whole week before I picked up the book again and finally like finished epilogue two, but it probably talks about me and my sensibilities as a reader and not being super interested in those 
philosophy chapters that Tolstoy put in. So just know that that's coming from me and the other writings did work. Anyways, I, I really enjoyed War and Peace. I'm really glad I read it and I'm really glad it's over. Um, and I like Tolstoy enough that I definitely want to pick up something else by him. Um, I'm just not in a mega rush because this took quite quite a while to read. So my the final book, the final book I'm going to be talking about is probably my favorite, but it's also the one that I finished the most recently. So I might just be coming off of a, you know, an excitement from finishing the book, you know? And that is Eleanor Catton's The Luminaries. <laughs> um, so what is, what is this about? This is set in uh, 1866, rather, in New Zealand during the New Zealand Gold Rush. A murder has taken place and some gold is missing and you are basically on a mystery ride <laughs> to figure out who committed the murder, what is going on, and what is going on with this gold. Now, this is very much a link to astrology and there was a whole bunch of really wonderful astro astrological things going on and like this play on good versus bad, light versus dark, um, the numbers. So like, for example, the first section is 360 pages, um, you know, and there's like these phases of the moon. So there was like a huge connection with that. But as somebody who's not really into astrology, I didn't pay attention necessarily to to the astrological bits as like a layer in the book. And just as a, as a reader coming to this, this was so well done. It was so intricately plotted. I mean, literally a slow clap to Eleanor C Patton for the plotting of this book alone. Now, I will say, Structurally, the luminaries, weirdly, is is like is like the Iliad from from Homer. Um, I read the Iliad last year, the end of last year, and there was this struggle that I had with the Iliad where I was not sure what's going on. I wasn't quite connecting or grasping the world up until chapter 17. So there's like a ton of world building in the Iliad up until chapter 17 or 18, book 17 or 18 rather and then you're off to the races and the book is basically basically at least for me the Iliad was unput downable up until the very end because I found that after book 17 or 18 it, it was just phenomenal I, it had an energy to it that uh, lit me up inside basically. Um, and the luminaries is very much like that you spend the first 360 pages um, hearing, uh, reading rather, of kind of a confusing narrative about what's going on. And of course you have all these missing pieces and you're not really sure who's lying or telling the truth. And there is a lot going on in those first 360 pages. But I think if you can get through that first chunk, um, the rest of it definitely gets easier. It's just that first section that I think could really turn a lot of readers off because you're reading like a book's length worth of kind of confusing. I don't know. It's things that are just not quite adding up, not quite lining up. And for me, that was a motivator. I wanted to know what happened. I was like, I, I trust Eleanor Catton will bring it all together in the end. And she does. She does a wonderful job. Um, but yeah, there's just definitely like a part where you kind of have to come to grips with yourself as a reader and be like, am I going to do this or am I not? And I just decided to do it. And it, it definitely paid off. There was a point in the novel when things are starting to become, I'm going to set this down, when things are becoming a little more clear. And I was like, I must know what happens. I, I must know what happens. And I'm not like that with books, like, like ever, <laughs> like at all ever. Um, and so now I'm wondering, am I more of a mystery reader than I thought? Because I was just so sucked in. So if you guys have any recommendations as to, um, you know, books like The Luminaries that are mis literary and mysterious, I would love to know because um, this Lu The Luminaries was a book that definitely worked for me. Anyways, I'm gonna stop gushing about The Luminaries. I read this with a self-formed book group that we call ourselves the Up To No Good Book Club. Um, and that contains AJ from AJ Down Reads and Writes, Jolene from Bookworm Adventure Girl, uh, Fraser Simon of Fraser Simon's Springboard Thought, Sandy from Miss Reads A Lot, and then several subscribers named Sonia, Angela, and Deb. So this is the group that I read it with and we definitely had some, some mixed reviews about it but I was the one that was like I loved it it was amazing I want to read it again like tomorrow okay so that's it for me thank you so much for being here thank you so so much for watching I really really appreciate it and I will see you all in my next one bye guys